right, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you today. All of you, we're so glad you're with us, and, and uh, we got quite a packed house here this morning, so thank you so much for being here. You know, two young women were riding on a bus one day, and the one was reading uh, this book called The Road Less Traveled. And it's a book about how difficult roads can oftentimes cause us to grow in ways that we never imagined. And uh, there was, like I said, somebody sitting next to this uh, young woman, and, and she said to her, well, what are you reading here? And she said, well, it's some book. It's some guide to life. It has some chapters in it. One's called Discipline. The other's called Love. Another chapter called Grace. And the other young woman said, well, what is grace? And she said, I don't know. I haven't gotten to grace yet. And you know, I think that for a lot of people, inside and outside the church, that is the secret of our soul. We haven't quite gotten to grace yet. Grace is something, of course, and we know in the church, it permeates the Word of God, especially the New Testament. Grace is something that saturates our songs. We sang about grace this morning. We like to talk about the gospel of the grace of God. When I was a young kid growing up in our home before meals at night, we quote-unquote said grace But if my observations are correct about my own life and about even the lives of other people that I know, we struggle to really grasp and live out grace. David Siemens was a Christian counselor. He's now with the Lord. Uh, But he wrote these, I think, really good words about this. He said, quote, I have been driven to the conclusion that the two major causes of most emotional problems amongst evangelicals are the failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness, and the failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace to other people. You know, I think he's right. I think he's right. And today, we have the privilege of looking at what I think is one of the most beautiful subjects there is, the amazing grace of God. And you know, I've had the privilege of preaching about grace for the last 40 plus years. I've loved preaching about it. I love singing about grace, right? Wonderful grace of our loving Lord, freely bestowed on all. I won't sing it for you. Those are the words. Um, I've, I've, as a pastor, I've, I've sought to apply the grace of God to people who were hurting and struggling. And then there came a time in my own life when I really needed to sense the grace of God. And I I want to just say to you, it became a balm to my heart. It became a supercharger in my life. I've learned so much about grace, and I could not live with the grace, the amazing grace of God in my life every single day. So we're going to talk about that. We're in this series that we're calling the awe of God, and we've been talking about the goodness of God and the love of God and the holiness of God and all of these amazing things. And today we're going to talk about the grace of God because we need God's grace more than we need just about anything in this life. And so we're going to explore this here this morning and have God uh, speak to our hearts. Let's pause a moment and just ask him to be our teacher. Father, we stop in this message here this morning because we cannot do anything. Jesus said we can do nothing without you. And I pray today that as I scratch the surface here of such a wide, such a deep subject, I pray that you would speak to us today what you want us to know hear and apply. And we thank you for this. In your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number one today, come with me to the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. And we're going to learn first of all today that grace brings us into a relationship with God. Grace does that. 
And here's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. He said, as for you, so he's talking about you and me, he's talking about us before, you know, we gave our lives to Christ. As for you, Paul said, you were dead in transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who was now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us, that's, that's all of us, by the way. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So we, we're born with a, a sin nature that alienates us from God. But, verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in what church? Mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. Literally, we are God's work of art. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I love that passage of Scripture, and I want to make sure we read all the way through there just so that we think here today about about grace. Now, the ancient Greeks, when they used the word grace, it was used to describe somebody who was strong and who stooped down and reached down to help somebody who was weak. That was how the ancient Greeks used this word. And so the Apostle Paul, of course, was the great, you know, author, not author of grace. Jesus is the author of grace, but Paul is the one who Jesus poured uh, an understanding of grace into. And uh, the Apostle Paul, I think, helps us with this. This is what I think Paul would say if he were here today. And that's, that's, that's pretty bold language there, isn't it, today? But I think here's what Paul would say if he defined grace. He said, grace is God's choice. God's decision to love, to forgive, to embrace, to help us when we have done nothing to earn it and we can never do anything to pay it back. That's grace, my friend. That's why you're here today. If you follow Jesus Christ, you're here today because of this grace. And this grace brings us into a relationship with God. You know, when I was uh, a young man putting myself through college, I worked construction, and one summer I worked with uh, this middle-aged guy by the name of Bob. And Bob was uh, kind of a handsome, you know, guy, and uh, he had a bunch of kids, and he had a wife and family that he was estranged from because he was cheating on his wife, and he was cheating on, on her with a young woman. And, you know, to the other guys at work, he would boast about this trophy girlfriend that he had and all this kind of stuff. But then when it was just Bob and me, you know, on a roof somewhere or doing something, he would confide in me about how much it was costing him and about how his wife had thrown him out of his house and how his kids wouldn't talk to him anymore and how he was going to lose his business and his retirement uh, and the business that he and his wife owned together. And, you know, I've met a lot of people like Bob down through the years. Like so many people, Bob actually thought like he was living the life. He thought he was free. But the truth of the matter is, is that he was in a prison of his own making. And, you know, maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe that's your life today. Maybe you, that, that was your life at one time. And, and Paul is describing that there in these opening verses. He's talking about our own prison that we were in before Jesus came to set us free. And he says things there, theological things in the opening uh, verses there, that we were dead in our our sins. We were spiritually dead, that we listened more to the enemy, Paul says, than we listened to God. 
that we lived our lives to gratify our own sinful nature, not God. But then there in verse 4, there, there's a hinge. And those, those two words there in verse 4 form this amazing hinge. The words, but God. Right, church? I mean, where would you be, my friend, without the fact that God has reached into your life and brought you to where you are? And Paul talks about that, so he's talking about there. But God, God, then he goes on to say that God poured his grace into our lives and he changed us. And so, question, what is the movement of God's grace according to this passage? It is this, to shine his light into the darkest recesses of our lives. That's what grace does. To raise us up, to raise us up so that we might see the grace of God. You know, church, hear me this morning. Grace is not something to run from. I mean, I meet so many people who they are just, they don't want, they're running from God. They, they're afraid of what God, now listen to me this morning. God is the one who will rescue you. He will forgive you. He will infuse his life into you. God does that, Paul says here, because of his grace, his grace. And so I know that some of us here this morning probably think that we're here as followers of Jesus Christ because we decided to study about Jesus. We decided to, you know, look about this stuff. We decided we'll investigate, we'll repent, we'll do all this stuff. Oh, no, 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 no. You are here today if you follow Jesus because God has gifted you to see yourself as you really are to confess your need of him, to find your hope in the righteousness of another person, namely Jesus Christ. You're here this morning because you were led by God to abandon your own confidence in your own performance and just come before God and receive his gift of grace. It is by grace that we are, sa they are, sa are saved through faith. Did you catch that? And not of yourself is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Grace brings us into a relationship with God. Secondly today, grace blesses us. Grace blesses us and transforms us. Just go back one chapter here to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read a long list of verses here again because I want you to get the flow of this passage and what Paul is wanting to say to us here, beginning in verse 2. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Then he goes on to describe it. Verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with, the pleasure, with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. You have a tattoo on you this morning. Some of you don't like to hear that, but it's true. The promised Holy Spirit who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those 
who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Well, you could spend all afternoon in that passage. And so I want you to get this down this morning, friends. The first, Paul is saying there, the first thing God did when he brought you into a relationship with him is he blessed you. He blessed you. And look at what he says there in this passage. He chose you. He adopted you. His blood redeemed you. He forgave you. He lavished grace on you. He gave a purpose to your life. He gave you an inheritance. Like you're not an orphan. You're not ever alone. You have God and his resources in your life. He sealed you with his spirit. That means that if you know Jesus, God is going to keep you for all eternity. Glory to God for that. God, grace not only brings us into a relationship with God, but grace blesses us and transforms us, giving us all of these things. Wow. Now, you know, many of you know that my wife is an artist, and uh, if you come to our home, uh, you'll walk around our home, and you're going to feel like you're in an art gallery. It's everywhere. And uh, I love it. I love to walk through our home and look at my wife's art. Uh, her mother is an artist as well. We have some of her pieces there and, and all that stuff. And uh, when we renovated our condo, at first I was going to have the upstairs room up there. That was going to be my man cave. And then my wife said, I think that'd be a good studio. And so my line during all those uh, months were, whatever you want, honey. You got it. I'm going to write the check for it. So she took the upstairs, and uh, she made it her studio. And one of the things we did, we put new lighting up there because there wasn't a light in the place up in that room up there. As we put all this lighting up there so that it could, you know, showcase and shine on, uh, on her, on her uh, stuff there, her, her art. And sometimes, you know, when we go to bed at night and we turn out the lights, I think to myself, you know what? Those paintings are so amazing that the lights should never be turned off in those rooms. Now, that's a fan speaking right there, right? Well, listen to me today. If you are God's child, you are a gallery of his amazing grace. I got that from Paul Tripp. The walls of your heart, the walls of your life are covered with the gorgeous artwork of power for the weakness of sin. Forgiveness for the guilt of sin. Deliverance from the bondage of sin. Your life has all of that because of grace. Grace is God doing beautiful things within you. And yet I think for a lot of us here today, the artwork is there, but the lights in the gallery are out. <laughs> we, don't, we don't stop and be amazed by God's grace. You ever stop and just think about the stunning beauty of God's grace to you in your life? I don't think we take enough time to celebrate that. And so what happens is so oftentimes in our lives, we give way to weakness when we have power at our disposal. We hide in shame when we've been fully forgiven by God. We surrender to addictions of all kind when in fact, God says here that we have freedom, freedom through the power of Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you today, where are you on this? Are you someone who regularly takes the time to celebrate the amazing grace of God? Are the lights on in your gallery of God's grace? Are you celebrating it and, and just living and existing and, and re uh, relishing what Paul says here, that he lavished grace on us? And so today I have, a, I have an assignment. I want you to go home. Wait about 17 minutes, but uh, go home today and write a prayer about how God's been gracious in your life. Or maybe you are at a spot in your life where you need his grace. Okay, write a prayer about what you need, what kind of grace you need from God. Or maybe there's somebody in your life who needs your grace 
who needs you to come and say, you know what? I don't care what you've done. There's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. Grace. God's grace brings us into a relationship with God. God's grace blesses us. And then thirdly today, God's grace helps us in hard times. Anybody ever walk through a hard time? That was a dumb question, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Why don't you turn there with me for a moment? 2 Corinthians 12. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking about a hard time in his life that he was walking through even as, even as he wrote these words. And they're such beautiful words. They, they've, they, they've come to mean so much uh, to me in, in, in my life. And I'm going to begin halfway through the seventh verse where Paul says this. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited. Now, why would Paul want to be conceited? Well, earlier in this passage, he talks about some of the things that God allowed him to see, right? Like God allowed him to go somewhere, some spot in heaven, and see things, Paul says, that I can't even speak about. And so I don't know about how you would be, like if God brought me to heaven, like I'd, I'd, I'd want to come back and tell everybody about it. How about a church? And then I would want to say, well, look, I was in heaven, so whatever I say goes in this situation, right? And so Paul is talking about that. He said, you know what? I, I, I can see where, you know, I could become, I could become conceited. Here we, so therefore, he says, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a what church? A thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, and these these words are in red. So this, this is Jesus speaking right to Paul. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Some of you need to underline that in your Bible today. Therefore, I'll boast. Boast? Really? I'll boast, Paul says, all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight. And what's wrong with this guy? I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. I delight in these things. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, that's an amazing paradoxical set of verses. Did I just coin a word there, paradoxical? Now, let's face it today. I mean, we don't like our weaknesses our hardships, our difficulties, right? We run from them. We try to cover them up because we don't want people thinking there's something wrong with us, right? As if they already don't, right? We hate how our weaknesses make us feel. But God is saying to us here today that grace makes weaknesses, hardships, and difficulties things to be welcomed because they open us up to God's power. Now, we don't know what it was that Paul was up against. Some people think it was physical there because he says this was a thorn in the flesh, right? Other people think this was a spiritual battle that he was facing because he says here it was a messenger from Satan. So what we do know is this, that it was painful. Maybe it was emotionally painful. Maybe it was... Mentally, pain. It, might, it might be physically painful. Why do we know that? Because he says it was a thorn in his flesh. Now, we think of a thorn as something that really small we can just pluck out. But the word thorn is actually better translated stake. So Paul, we know, was a tent maker. And so, you know, think about putting a tent up and driving a stake into the ground so that your tent could hold to that. That's the idea when Paul uses the word thorn. He's talking about something that went deep inside and and really, really was getting to him. 
You ever have a time like that when that's going on in your life? And like us, he, he prayed about it, right? In fact, it says here he prayed over and over and over about this situation. And we do the same thing. And, and praise God, many, many times when we have a thorn in our, a stake in our flesh, we, we pray and, and God lifts it, right? Praise God for how many of you have been healed of all kinds of things going on in your life. Praise God. But then there are those times when God actually says, you know what, no, I'm not, I'm not going to allow this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow this to continue, actually. I'm not going to remove this because uh, I want you to learn how to rely on my grace. And why does he do that? I mean, there are probably hundreds of reasons why he would do that. But I, I think, in, in, at least in my life, Here's why oftentimes God does that. Sometimes God allows things to stay in our lives, and it's not what we want, but it's precisely what we need. So a couple of months ago, I, some, I, 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 told, uh, I told you all that I was at my counselor one day, and, and I, was, I was bemoaning some of the things that I you know, after a couple years of working on stuff that I was still wrestling with, and he said to me, Bob, God has allowed this in your life because this is exactly what you need. And I wanted to say, shut up. (laughs) And we have a good relationship. I can do that. But he's right. He was right. What I think Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 12 is that Jesus came to give us grace not just for our past but also for our present. And I think this is a mistake a lot of believers make. They, they, they understand and they revel in the grace of God and the grace of God you know, gets them saved and then they kind of forget it. And they walk through life as if, okay, I can do all this in my own strength now. No, no. God's grace is here for the tough questions in your life, for the tensions in your marriage and and your work. God's grace is there for sexual temptation in your life that might feel overwhelming. God's grace is there for the torment of anxiety or depression or fear. God's grace. I love these words from Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 3. Listen to these words. These are Old Testament words of grace. God says this, or Isaiah wrote this about Jesus, about God. He said, a bruised reed he'll not break, and a smoldering wick he'll not snuff out. That's an amazing promise. You ever walk through the woods and see a bruised reed, a broken limb, and you just kind of reach up and you pull it down from the tree. You ever do that? You ever, you know, have a, a, a flickering candle in front of you and it's kind of annoying you because it's flickering and so you just reach out and snuff it out? That's what he's talking about there. And he's saying to us that our Father in heaven will never do that to you and me. He will never, never break us off. He will never snuff us out. And so you ought to get this down this morning, church. When you know God, you never, ever fall from grace. You fall into grace. That's what Paul is saying here. I'm in a tough spot. I'm in a crazy spot, Paul says, and I'm falling into grace because Jesus said, that's what I'm going to give you. And you know, sadly, the church of Jesus Christ you know, doesn't always exercise grace. We have a reputation, sadly, of shooting our wounded instead of reaching down and giving them a hand up. And so I understand that we have to face consequences of sin, right? And all you got to do is read the headlines, and you can see there's a lot of evangelical leaders who have, you know, have had some sin in their lives, and and they're facing all of that stuff these days. But listen to me today, church. God's way of grace God's way of grace is not to snuff us out. God's way of grace is not to rip out. God's way of grace is to come to us, to come to us in our time of need and help us deal with our crap and take us to a better place. You feel alone today? You feel broken? You feel like maybe your life is flickering? 
When our hope is fading and our faith is weak, Jesus comes to us not as a life destroyer, but as a life giver. He comes in grace, the comfort, to strengthen, to heal, to restore. And so every single day of my life, every single day, I don't leave my house in the morning without coming before God and coming before his throne of grace and just saying, oh, Jesus, would you, would you pour your grace into my life today? Would you rescue me by your grace from my evil desires? Will you rescue me today by your grace from my fears, from my anxiety, from the pride from the resentment that, that rears its ugly head and teach me how to thrive and flourish by grace, by grace. And so grace brings us into a relationship with God. We come into this relationship with God. Grace blesses our lives. God, grace gives us all these amazing things. Grace also helps us when we are in need, and then finally today, grace gets us ready for glory. Grace gets us ready for glory. Listen to what Paul said here, and we're just going to fly through this, but in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, <clears throat> Paul writes about the grace of God, and he says this, for the grace of God has appeared, that offers salvation, has appeared to all people. And so here's what grace does, church. Listen to me. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Did you catch what Paul is saying there? He's saying that grace not only saves us and brings us into this amazing relationship with God, but grace teaches me how to say no to sin and gets me ready for when I'm going to stand in front of Jesus Christ. Grace does all of that in your life and mine. I read the other day of a young uh, little girl by the name of Amy. She was kind of strong-willed. Anybody have uh, one of those kids? Were you one of those kids? Shame on you, right? Anyway, she liked to ride her tricycle in places where her mommy didn't want her to ride. And so one day, her mommy got really frustrated with her, and uh, she went out into the front yard. She said, all right, she said, all right, all right, Amy, here's a tree. Here's the edge of the driveway. Here's our sidewalk. You can ride your tri tricycle in between all of this stuff, but you can't go over the edges, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back into the house and I'm going to watch you. And if you decide to, you know, defy me here, I'm going to come out and I'm going to spank you in front of all your friends. Well, Amy was not to be deterred. She stuck out her little hip and she said, well, you better spank me now because I got places to go. Right? I had a son like that. Ugh. Now his wife has to deal with him. But you know, if that isn't a picture of the human heart, I don't know what is. How about a church? I mean, that's us. Are we not always testing the limits in our minds, with our eyes? Right? We test the limits of pride. We test the limits of greed. We test the limits of stubbornness. We test the limits of lust. We just test the limits if I read these passages correctly today, spiritual sanity <laughs> begins. When we come before the living God and we say, God, I confess to you that I love to test the limits. And because of that, I've defied you like hundreds of times. God, I confess to you today that, I mean, there is something broken inside of me that try as I might, I can't fix. Have you ever said that to God? Have you ever admitted that? Like, there's something broken in me. But don't sit there and act like it's not true about you, because I know it is. It's true about me. 
to come before God and say, oh God, there, there's something broken in me. I can't fix it. But you say in your word that Jesus died and rose again to fix in my heart and life what's broken by grace. You paid a debt I could never pay myself. And I, I want to receive your love, your forgiveness, your grace, your power in my life. You say, is that it? That's it right there. That is the start of when true life begins. Amen, church? Humbling before God like that and just say, God, I, I have a need that only you can meet. And here's what the Bible says about that. The Bible says that God is able to make all grace abound towards you. The Bible says that God is a throne of grace where we can come to find grace and help in our time of need. And there are some of us here this morning who really need to do that. Maybe you did it when you were a kid, but it's been a long time since you really walk with God. Today, you just need to come back and say, today, God, I just, I surrender myself to you. Some of you are thinking to yourself, oh, man, my, you, you, if you only knew what I've done, Bob, there's no sin that grace can't cover. I love what Bunyan wrote in Pilgrim's Progress and when he came to God when he came to God and asked for his forgiveness he said the burden rolled off my back and it went down a hill and it went into the to an empty grave ah, forgiveness grace You might be here today as a Christ follower and you're saying, oh boy, Bob, I just need a fresh touch of God's grace. Well, come to the throne of grace where grace abounds to find help and strength in time of need. We're going to sing here great song as, as we close and I'm just going to encourage you where you are hold your hands out to him just ask him to pour his grace into your life maybe you'd like to come forward this morning and just stand here as well and just ask God for his grace to save you, his grace to help you and strengthen you this is a time for us each and every one of us to come to God's throne of grace. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks for listening to Church of the Open Door Sermons Podcast. Church of the Open Door is based out of York, Pennsylvania, and we exist to help everyone discover life change through Jesus. For more information about Church of the Open Door or for locations and service times, be sure to visit us at codyork.org. Thanks again so much for listening.